Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Mark Wilczek. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Link11. With me on today's panel is a special guest, David Holmes, um, Senior Analyst at Forrester Research. David, great to have you back. Thanks, Mark. Just a couple of remarks to set the stage before we delve into our discussion. So last time when we spoke, we stated that DDoS and other cyber attacks have significantly increased during the pandemic. At the same time, we're now also operating in the so-called zero outage era, meaning that people simply expect digital services to be available 24 seven. We've also witnessed a massive shift towards remote work and we expect that trend to continue beyond the pandemic. But not only remote access and VPN service are moving into the spotlight, organizations are expediting their cloud strategy. And as a consequence, um, they need to put more emphasis on their layer seven safeguards, meaning cloud applications and, uh, and APIs, especially so in the context of industry 4.0 cases where there is very little room for failure. As a result of our discussion last time, it also became clear that time to mitigate is the single most relevant metric when it comes to DDoS protection. Now, why is that the case? Because if an organization is under attack, there's only one thing that truly matters, and that is how long does it take to detect that threat and to mitigate that threat and to bring the situation back to normal. And this is being expressed in time to mitigate. We also talked about the necessity to leverage artificial intelligence, automation and machine learning in order to be able to instantly dis, uh, detect these abnormalities and to instantly uh, mitigate incoming um, attacks. Now, with that being said, let's just move on and let's just see where we're at right now because a lot has happened um, over the past couple of months. And I would like to kick off the discussion by asking you, David, we witnessed the, um, the court ruling by the European Court of Justice just a little while ago, basically declaring the US uh, EU privacy shield as invalid. And I would like to ask you now, how do you see that is um, going to impact purchasing decisions going forward? Sure, Mark. Um, so here's what we're advising our clients. Yes, the EU uh, US privacy shield is, is down. Shields are down. But um, the, the sort of workaround for the moment is something called a standard contract clause. And we're advising our clients to pay special attention to how they're setting up those clauses, but first to be able to make sure that they map their uh, application data on where it's flowing. Is it leaving the region? Is it leaving sovereignty? Is it residing in place? And if it's not, then you need to have standard contract clauses in place. The, the, what I have heard is that the, the UK may be impacted next. So anybody who has data leaving, say, the EU region and headed for the UK, may need to have a standard contract clause in place. Um, and then again, if, if that may be changing as well, if these things come under review by the ECJ, then I could, I could easily see a buyer of a technology deciding, you know, let's maybe what if we just instead made sure our data didn't leave the region, right? And, and that's actually a trend that I've heard um, throughout my career talking about DDoS around the world, once you step outside the United States, there are countries that have requirements to not leave, to have their data not leave their country. And it can be a little bit tricky with the way that some people set up their, their DDoS protection services because they will have maybe extra capacity in other countries, but not necessarily a way to make sure that that, that they don't kick those in for certain customers. So it's a tricky situation. Right. And and David, another thing that I wanted to ask you is uh, just months ago, if not even weeks ago, we saw um, a big spike of extortion campaigns targeting various industry segments, including uh, critical infrastructure providers, but also, you know, hosters very specifically. Um, what do you think is the reason um, for those criminal groups now to, um, you know, look so... Um, precisely at the critical infrastructure providers on one hand side, but also on hosters as their you know, preferred targets? Mm, good question. And I hesitate to, to 
to say what was their what was their reason for doing it because in my experience sometimes the the motivation for why an attack or a campaign happened doesn't come out until months later if it comes out at all but i do want to point out that obviously given the circumstances of everybody still being in lockdown um, and that further lockdowns coming if you think about it so much of the world has had to accelerate their digital transformation plans for not just not just e-commerce, but think of everything. For example, people going to see the doctor, right? Where, whereas before telemedicine and seeing your doctor on a screen like this was something that hardly anybody did. It is, I've heard it's experienced over uh, an order of magnitude of growth of doctors doing hundreds of, of sessions like this uh, every week. And so, so, so much of life has just become digital. Of course, of course, we're going to notice digital attacks more and more. Um, from I was looking through some data that, that that we collect. So at Forrester, we survey thousands of, of respondents every year about buying decisions and whether or not they were breached, and if so, how they were breached, or were they attacked. And overall, the last time we had data was 24% of our respondents said that they had been attacked with the DDoS in the previous year, but among the telecommunications industry, 41% said they had, a significantly higher percentage. And as a matter of fact, among our telecommunications respondents, DDoS was the number one attack vector at 41%, followed by, I think, um, there's a couple other ones in there, uh, credential, credential attacks as well. But it could be that hosting providers have always seen more DDoS than say, just retailers. Right. Have you have do you have any insight in, into those attacks? Have you seen any uh um against your customers? Yes, basically we've also witnessed the very same thing. So we've uh, been seeing a big spike in DDoS attacks over the past couple of months, very much a focused around ISPs and hosters, but also likewise critical infrastructure providers. So various uh, criminal syndicates and organizations have basically unleashed a whole um, set of extortion waves and extortion campaigns across multiple different geographies. Um, typically what happened was um, organizations got an email uh, that basically demanded you know, up to several hundred thousands of US dollars in bitcoins or else these organizations threatened um, their targets that they would unleash DDoS attacks of up to two uh, terabit per second, and uh, we've saw we've seen um, a, a massive um, shift of these you know blackmail campaigns. And um, while initially I, th I think some organization were not really sure whether that was a legitimate threat or it was just a big bluff, but what happened was I think in some countries, especially if, if we look at New Zealand, we also saw that. Um, apparently, they um, they unleashed quite powerful attacks, uh, which resulted in the New, uh, New Zealand Stock Exchange uh, being offline for as much as four days. So um, I think it's a serious threat, and um, we also saw you know a big spike in DDoS attacks um, around that time frame, uh, targeted at some of our clients. But uh, you know, thankfully, we were able to interfere and to you know prevent uh, bad things from happening. Mm. Yeah, the DDoS extortion is almost as old as DDoS itself. Uh, um, I remember, I think it might have been um, like the, the Lizard Squad and then the Lazarus Group. Um, and I think some of those actors were named in these recent attacks as well, or at least people purporting to be from those groups. I think th there's discussion going on in the, in the, in the InfoSec community about should people pay these ransoms and i think there's a nuance between if you between say ransomware and a ddos extortion with ransomware your data may already be gone right and the i, I think um, many federal agencies will recommend people never pay um, but some have said in the past well you know it's up to you if you're going to pay we're not going to stop you there isn't a law but there is discussion about whether or not there should be a law which would at least protect people from saying they could just say i can't pay it would be against the law so um fascinating with, with ddos it's a slightly different story right 
I, I would think that if somebody were faced with that situation and they were going to have to pay a significant amount of money, a, a more resilient solution would be to put in place defenses, right, to protect yourself rather than give money to attackers who could then buy more equipment um, and threaten more people or come and threaten you. Or God forbid, if your name got out that you actually do pay ransoms and extortions, um, you could you would see other groups coming and saying, where's where's our share? So, so it's a little bit different with DDoS. And I think the defenses for DDoS, thank goodness, are much more mature than they are against uh, against ransomware. So true, and uh, we also strongly advise not to make any payments uh, because, indeed, um, not just that it might have now legal implications. You know, referring to the most recent um, a note that was issued by the U.S. Department of Treasury, but um, also it basically, you know, sends the wrong signal. And the last thing you want to see happening is, you know, bad, you know, these bad guys basically coming back and he's asking for even, you know, greater, greater demands. So there, there is definitely, you know, a big downside when it comes to making these payments. Yeah, yeah. It's as old other- as time itself. And hey, uh, one thing that reminds me, that reminds me, it's it's test season for many schools around the world. And I, I remember seeing recently a um, an article, I can't remember exactly where I saw it, but it was yet another example of a student DDoSing um, his school so that he could get out of a test, right? Yes. Th- this has happened so often. Um, it's uh, ridiculous. Since I've been following it, I'm not so, and now that all school is being done online, it's so, it would be so much easier to, to buy yourself a couple of extra days. Are you guys seeing a, a, an uptick in, in attacks against uh, the education system? Well, yes, of course. I mean, it was just, um, I think, a couple of months ago that this big, big campaign was um, targeted at the, I think it was the Miami-Dade um, school and educational system that was taken offline. And indeed, it's it's a um, it's a common observation that kids are unleashing DDoS attacks in order to get away of their upcoming exams, basically, or at least to delay it. And, you know, what it also boils down to is it tells us something, you know, it says or it tells us something how easy it is to procure uh, these DDoS attacks to a point where even, you know, teenagers can even uh, easily do it. They don't need to be IT geeks. They don't need, you know, um, um, a fortune in order per, uh, to pay for these attacks. They're so simple and so easy to procure. It's almost like child's play. And that's precisely what happens. So... Um, yeah, it's also a warning signal towards, let's say, the corporate space, not to mess up with the kids because <laughs> they can backfire big time. <laughs> um, David, the other thing I wanted to ask you, though, um, regarding you know corporate infrastructures, talking about the corporate sector. So what we've been seeing is that organizations, large and small, on the back of the pandemic are expediting their cloud um, plans and, and transformation plans. And I think you comment, mm-hmm. commented on that just minutes ago. But on the back of that, IT is getting a lot more fragmented and a lot more you know, distributed across a whole range of different platforms and services. So from a security standpoint and from a DDoS standpoint in particular, what would be your advice? For organizations to consider when basically you know broadening up the whole IT surface and perhaps also introducing you know new vulnerabilities. That's a great question, and it and it gets very complicated. One really interesting data point that is is always stuck in my head is I mentioned that survey that we do every year uh, among security decision makers. One of the questions we ask them is, "What are your major challenges?" in IT security. And number the number two answer is the evolving and changing nature of IT threats, of IT security threats, right? You'd think that would be the number one, but it's not. The number one problem they are facing is the complexity of their IT environment, right? So they know it, they actually know it. The large enterprise knows our biggest problem isn't the attackers, our biggest problem is the the giant conga line of different technologies that we have somehow either acquired or bought 
and now we have to support it all um or that you know even if it wasn't their fault right it, these things were all bought before i got here and i have to support them that is their that is they recognize that as their number one challenge um and i keep looking for data that would suggest that that organizations are taking steps to simplify and i never see the data you know, it's 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 like even though everyone knows this is their biggest problem, they're not necessarily taking steps to fix the complexity of their environment, right? And maybe it's for some organizations, right? They have to, they just have to focus on the fires that are in front of them without necessarily taking a longer, more proactive approach. So I I don't know what you guys are seeing if if that if that's a complaint that you get with uh, the customers that you talk to. Well, so first of all, the uh, the trend towards more fragmented IT landscape is something that we've also been witnessing, um, you know, throughout very many um, geographies. It's it's a very common pattern, basically. But uh, what we also realized is that some organizations, if they move beyond just test and dev scenarios, uh, they're upgrading their arsenals. They're they're adding an additional layer of security to make sure that. Um, their productive systems um, are up and running at all times. They're not going to get disrupted. So we've actually had a number of even you know, users moving over from some of the public cloud providers after encountering some issues and even downtime, asking us to put an extra layer of security in between to make sure they can you know, continuously run their, their estate on the various, various public clouds, but it's all backed. Uh, with an extra layer of you know security defenses from our side to make sure mm -hmm. uh, these services are available at all times. Right, right, and it's it seems like DDoS is because of the world has shifted to so much is digitally transformed now, and so much of business just happens online. I, I heard I think it was just last week Microsoft said that there are hundreds of thousands of employees can work from home indefinitely, like forever. Um, since so much of life has moved into the digital realm, the DDoS protection, which some people saw as like an almost like an insurance policy before, all of a sudden is now has a new importance, right? So this is the interesting times we live in, Mark. Yeah, that, that's times. that's the so true but do you think that this is also going to kind of to last for longer because if you look at you know research very often you see other things that are being prioritized and that appear on you know priority lists somewhat ranked higher including things such as bc uh, phishing ransomware and ddos sometimes mm -hmm. comes only you know fourth fifth or sixth item would you envision that to change going forward would that also depend upon industries or what are your um, assumptions or, or estimates? Let me give you a two-part answer. The Yes, it does depend on, on the industry because some industries, of course, get attacked much more frequently than others. Um, uh, the gaming, uh, the financial um, uh, auctions, they all get attacked quite a bit and they're very, very, very aware uh, of DDoS. And in our in our surveys with our respondents, we find that DDoS is fairly mature in that I think in starting in about 2016, that was the first year that it really, really, I don't wanna say peaked, but it really climbed up to um, uh, probably 60% of the organizations that we surveyed had either bought uh, DDoS and had implemented it or were implementing it. Um, and some were even planning on upgrading it. And if you add them all together, you get 80%. So eight out of 10 had already um, bought it, they were upgrading it, or they were going to buy it. So so it's, it's, it's not something that's unknown to them. They're clearly, um, uh, they're clearly invested in the technology. I don't necessarily know how it will change. Here's the second part of my answer is, we will have the latest survey data probably in a month. So I encourage you to check back with Forrester if you're curious to see uh, what happened in 2020. 
But David, maybe just to follow up on, on that question. So some observe uh, or one observation from, from my end personally is that sometimes if I speak with end users, CISOs from large organizations, security managers, oftentimes they you know work with a misperception that they simply think, you know, we bought something like three years ago or four years ago, we're good. You know, no need to upgrade the arsenal. You know, life is good. We haven't encountered a massive attack over the last couple of years. You know, we're perfectly safe. Um, and still they're running, you know, a whole lot of legacy IT equipment underneath. It's all hardware based. It's all based upon, you know, human interaction. Somebody needs to, you know, pull the block or, you know, take an action manually. And of course, if there is this big DDoS attack hitting them, you know, the next morning, it takes ages for them to rectify the situation. But unfortunately, they only learn it, you know, the hard way, you know, once they're getting hit. And sometimes we really have to, you know, overcome that myth and that misconception that simply because they bought something, whatever it was, you know, many years ago, it's just no longer adequate, you know, given the, you know, the changing threat landscape. I mean, have you, you know, had similar encounters and, you know, how do you deal with that? Well, Mark, in general, everyone learns the hard way. That's one of my observations about humans in general, is that if you ever if you ever find somebody who who learns things not the hard way, hire that person, um, <laughs> put put them in charge of something. But um, most people do learn the hard way. I can say this, you know, if you go back into the DDoS space, maybe eight years ago or ten years ago, it was very common for you, you know, if you had you probably had a big on-prem network or your own data centers. And you would buy literal appliances to to stock into uh, into your data centers and to do your protection. And if if you were in an industry that wasn't attacked very often, you never really got good at fighting off DDoS attacks because you never really got the practice, right? If it would just happen twice a year. Um, and I think the industry, not the industry, but companies have learned or have decided, that you know what they just want to consume this as a service from now on. So when we when we survey our our uh, respondents um, since 2016, approximately between 75 and 80 percent of the respondents say, hey, you know what we need DDoS. And we just want to buy it as a service. We just want to pay experts who deal with this all the time. Let them handle it. And um, that's definitely the trend. The trend of the market. The the hardware that's being sold is typically sold to people who are providing the services, not people who are building their own DDoS defenses these days. Mm -hmm. But it's it's a very crowded space, and um, you know, unfortunately, I think now everyone is talking about the, or is using the same jargon, right? Everyone is talking about machine learning. Everyone is talking about AI because it's so popular, right? Everyone is, is stressing the need for automation. So it's very, very crowded and the messaging seems to be like the same. So what would you recommend, you know, possible buyers um, from an SLA standpoint, for example, to consider in order to really differentiate between, you know, apples and oranges? Mm, that is a gr that's a great question. I, I can't answer it yet. I'm about to embark on a study of SLAs, but I have, I think w if you're a buyer and you're considering between two companies and one has an SLA and one does not, I would con I would recommend you give points to the company that has an SLA. And then you're going to have to read it quite carefully. And the SLAs, enough of the vendors have them now that you should be able to compare them. Right. That's work you'll probably have to do and that I encourage you to do. But Mark, I had I wanted to ask you a question. And so in, in studying some of the different approaches for distributed denial of service protection, one of the approaches is baselining, right? Mm -hmm. where, um, where a company, a protection service may build a baseline of what the customer's normal traffic looks like and, um, and then do basically like anomaly detection for things that are, that are not like the normal traffic. Um, I have not made up my mind about the, the efficacy of that approach, but do, it seems to me that a baseline for a customer would be required for anybody who's using artificial intelligence or machine learning, because it would have to know what good versus bad was. And so my question for you is, is if you do that approach, um, how do you handle false positives 
And what if the customer's traffic pattern changes? Like for example, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, when everybody went home, I'm sure there was a massive change in what traffic looked like. That, that's, that's actually a brilliant question, um, David. So first and foremost, you know, a static approach is extraordinarily dangerous these days. And I think that's also one of the differentiators when um, you know, evaluating different vendors, because not just due to the pandemic, but generally speaking, as organizations um, advance with their digital strategies, they introduce new apps, um, uh, new cloud services, and what have you, you know, their, their traffic pattern is most likely going to change. Um, and across so many different, you know, use cases and industries, you always have special events, things that are, you know, difficult to predict. Take media, for example. So whatever their you know, daily routine might be in terms of their traffic pattern, if there is a breaking event, you know, breaking news um, that is going to unfold, you know, the traffic pattern is going to change almost instantly within minutes. You know? And um, a static approach is really dangerous because the static approach would you know, misclassify that traffic as something malicious. So what you really need to do is you need to look at multiple different parameters. So it's not just a case of you know the um, um, the source of origin, for example. Um, it has to do with velocity. It has to do uh, with latency in the back. And in order to prevent um, false positives, now back to your question, what you really need to do as a vendor is you need to look at all these different parameters at once, and you need to, you need to make informed decision based upon multiple data points that are being collected at the very same time. For example, take media. If there was an, a breaking event and now you know, traffic is going up big time, as long as latency is not, um, is not a problem, as, as long as the IT systems are able to absorb that incoming traffic, there was no need to interfere. So what you wanna do is you wanna make sure you know, your system is only going to interfere once you know, that user behavior is going to cause problems. If it's not going to cause problems, why do you want that system to take an action? It might be legitimate users, you know, visiting your website. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, to to you know delve a little bit deeper, just imagine it was all legitimate, and still your system was going down the train because it's just being overwhelmed with traffic. You know, likewise, you still want you know your system to take an action because it's not just about preventing you know, bad traffic from causing a problem, what you really want to make sure is, is at the end of the day, your systems are up and running at all times. And even if that means cutting off some of your legitimate traffic in that very situation, that very moment temporarily, might still be you know, a wiser decision as opposed to letting your system go down the train and to cause an outage, right? So there is always pros and cons. But um, you know, cutting off uh, legitimate traffic might actually be a good idea if you know that legitimate traffic starts causing problems. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Well, thanks for that. I had another question too. Um, I'm trying to think of what it was. It was simply, you know, what your your last answer was so scintillating. I just got lost <laughs> in the brilliance uh, and the wisdom coming out of your mouth. Um, uh, oh, well, if I think of it, I might send you an email. Excellent. Um, right. So I think we're coming to an end here anyways. Um, time flies, literally, and <clears throat> it's been a great pleasure interacting with you. It's actually always fun. So, you know, it's, it's, it's always <laughs> great having these discussions. So thank you so much for spending your time today with us, uh, David. It was great having you on today's webinar, and uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have another session sometime soon. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Stay safe. Bye. Bye.